for the audience, I'd just like to say this is Godfrey Bloom, former MEP and most famous amongst libertarians, I think, for quoting Murray Rothbard in the European Parliament. Godfrey, w would you describe yourself as a, a libertarian? Well, I'm a professional research economist. I have been all my life. Yes. Um, and I <clears throat> did sit on the Economic and Monetary Affairs Committee in the European Parliament for five, mm. five years of my ten in office. Yes. And I see myself, I think, primarily as a classical liberal. Um, yes, yes. Uh, I'm always very slightly careful when I say uh, libertarian because uh, although I do like to think I'm a libertarian, um, I don't follow narrowly any sort of disciple path, as it were. Right. Uh, because I find when I'm lecturing at universities, uh, somebody would stand up and say, ah, you know, so-and-so <laughs> wouldn't have agreed with you on that. Right. And uh, there's, no, there's no point in somebody suggesting that Hayek or Mises uh, wouldn't have agreed with me on a given point in 2016. Uh, you know, it's it, it's a fruitless, it's fruitless. Um, yes. So I, although I'm an extremely simpatico and a member of the Mises Institute, yes, uh, I yes. am not a dedicated follower of fashion, as it were. No, you do you do your own thing and try not to get labelled in some cultic that, that's right. way. Yes. Yes. Now. On to Brexit, uh, what I really want to talk to you about. Last month, uh, Nairi Woods, uh, who I, I didn't know, uh, who's a, an Oxford professor of global economic governance, whatever that is, uh, and, and she spoke um, quite firmly against uh, people like uh, yourself or myself, who uh, w would imagine that it was fairly easy to make trade deals uh, outside of the EU, or indeed to just have completely open free trade. Uh, she wanted to point out that it's a, l a bit more complicated than that, uh, in a slightly patronising way. Uh, what would your thoughts be on... on I watched her very carefully. I watched that clip very carefully. Yes. Um, I've lectured at most uh, you know, uh, Eng senior English universities on classical liberalism and economics, Mm -hmm. um, and indeed the Warsaw School of Economics, uh, Auburn University, Syracuse in New York. I, I've lectured all over the world, uh, so I probably actually paradoxically have more experience than she does. Yes. Um, but one of the things that I always uh, flag up is that uh, I for a few years was president of the, or patron rather, of the Newcastle University Free Trade Association. Uh, and... <clears throat> One year, uh, I'd just given a talk to a, the usual full house, because there's a great interest in uh, libertarian and classical liberal economics. Right. Um, and a young man came up to me. He was a second year, second year economics undergraduate. And he said he'd complained to his tutor uh, that they didn't cover Austrian economics. <laughs> in fact, they almost didn't cover everything, anything at all except Keynesian economics. Right. And the response here, which bears out, I think, completely the problem that the Oxford professor has, uh, in that that lecturer at Newcastle University said uh, to this young man, if you'd wanted to uh, you know, read about Hayek and Mises and Rothbard uh, and Bastiat, et cetera, et cetera, yes. you should have applied to read philosophy. Oh. The debate, the debate is over. Now, the problem that we have with this Oxford professor, uh, and it's Oxford University, and it's a professorship, and it sounds desperately important, and that certainly would impress the average bus driver, gardener, doctor, or butcher. Right. So why isn't it a professor at Oxford? Gosh, how jolly clever she must be. Right. But what one has to just bear in mind, she has absolutely no experience of, of any other school of economics. She mm. is a typical establishment neo keynesian So mm. she was, when she was speaking, she wasn't actually saying, um, I've looked at all the options, and I think this is the best option. Mm. What she was actually saying was, I only know and understand one option. Uh, right. And uh, another uh, illustration I used when I was speaking quite recently at a university, uh, we live in rural East Yorkshire, and my wife went into town uh, at the beginning of the summer to buy some more garden furniture, uh, and she bought 
a little table, wooden table and chair for the garden. She bought a couple of wicker sunbeds and she bought some beach towels. Now, that was all very optimistic, judging by the June we had, but let's <laughs> hope we have some sunshine sooner or later. Now, what was really interesting is that the little table and chair, which was the incidentally of a very high quality at hardwood, came from Vietnam. Uh, the mm. sunbeds came from uh, China. The bath towels came from Egypt. None of these countries with whom we have any form of trade agreement. Right. And uh, off went my uh, niece to help my wife collect it in a car that was made in South Korea. Now, what this professor doesn't understand, she's living so deeply in the past. You do not need a trade agreement to trade. Uh, mm. You certainly, you certainly don't need a political union to trade. Uh, only an Oxford professor away with the fairies for one moment could imagine you need political union to trade. Right. But of course, yeah. I spent 10 years out there. I spent 10 years out there. And I can tell you, everything moves at the s s snail's pace. You have to move at the absolute slowest pace. So when you're trying to negotiate a trade agreement, you have to take into consideration... Um, the leather workers in Italy, the shoemakers in Portugal. Uh, you have to take into consideration tobacco manufacturers in southern Romania. Mm. The whole thing is so slow. And of course, we all know now, don't we, uh, that it took seven years to get a trade agreement with Canada. Well, mm. look, I could have negotiated a trade agreement with Canada at the East India Cup in one lunch hour. I could have done that in an <laughs> afternoon. <laughs> Uh, I didn't need to wait. It's a dominion. We've been friends. We have the same queen. I mean, yes, how yes. bad can the European Union be? Yes. This lady, this professor at Oxford, uh, attractive lady, articulate lady, mm. hasn't the faintest idea about economics. She should have been a professor of basket weaving or something like that. <laughs> she certainly doesn't know her subject when it comes to economics. Mm. But of course... The question mark was, I think, would she make a good president um, of the Fed, of the U.S. Fed? Um, right. You know, could she replace <laughs> Janet Yellen? <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, yes, she could. <laughs> because Janet Yellen is also away with the fairies. Mm. Uh, so, uh, mm. oh, yes, she'd make a wonderful head of the United States Fed, uh, where I think not understanding global economics is a prerequisite. Correct, yes, yeah. There have been various videos making the rounds on Facebook, really, really simplistic arguments that are made. Uh, I think everyone's familiar with the video where Patrick Stewart is uh, making out as though uh, we wouldn't have human rights unless, of course, they've been legislated by centralised government, i.e. the European government. And uh, another video where British people, the, you know, people, the man on the street, as it were, was asked, could you give me one pound? And then they were given in return a, a £10 note. Uh, and they say, well, this is basically what the EU does for you. Uh, what are your thoughts on these very, very simplistic arguments and therefore on the EU in general? Well, one of the great problems that we have in the United Kingdom uh, is we've had a state education system for, you know, for well over 120 years now. Mm. Uh, and of course, that's proved to be a disastrous failure. Uh, as everything indeed the state does is, right. uh, almost everything the state ever does fails yes. uh, because the public sector, of course, have no discipline and have no com competitive uh, mm. situation. You either go to the local state school or you don't go at all. Mm. Uh, so that isn't any way of running an educational system. Mm. So your average child, your average young adult now, uh, probably anybody under my age, and I'm a colossal lazy, I'm 66, anybody underneath my age, anybody younger than me, probably has no idea that our freedoms uh, in the United Kingdom actually start uh, with common law. And common yes. law started in the United Kingdom, well, England, Wessex. Uh, it actually started with Alfred the Great and has developed over the last 1400 odd years. Uh, even the Normans adopted most of it. So we have a yes. system of law which has produced our human rights and, of course, which were encapsulated uh, in the 1688 Bill of Rights. Yes. Um, uh, and, and, and that has taken well over uh, three or four hundred years to develop into a constitutional monarchy, which we now have. Correct, and you have the yeah. principles of English law, uh, which mm. are, of course, the concept of habeas corpus, uh, trial by theory, 
the presumption of innocence, all these things, the United Kingdom has led the world. We yes, are yeah. world leaders historically uh, in freedom. Uh, you know, we were the first, we patrolled the oceans yes. uh, uh, 30 or 40 years before the American Civil War to put an end to slavery, international slavery. Right. Uh, 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 habeas corpus was adopted. North America has a copy of Magna Carta on mm. Capitol Hill, yes. uh, of course, yeah. as you will know. So we lead the way. Um, and of course, I don't know how many times we've rescued Europe, uh, autocracy, uh, and, uh, in, in, sure. in the uh, Louis the Fourteenth, Napoleon, uh, the Kaiser, Hitler. I'm actually getting a little bit set up as an Englishman of pulling out European chestnuts out of the fire. Um, mm -hmm. They're going to have to start sorting themselves out. It always seems to be our blood, toil, sweat and tears that drags them out of the mire. I'm getting fed up with them all, to be brutally frank. And I think the average Englishman is simply fed up with the average European. Go your own way. Make your own mistakes. Uh, you know, we, we just wash our hands of you. Uh, whole thing's going to collapse anyway. We're talking about Brexit. We're talking about Thursday. It doesn't really matter. The thing is already bankrupt. It's yes, all yeah. broke. It's a crumbling, um, it's a crumbling empire, uh, Byzantine, uh, Austro-Hungarian, use any analogy you like. It's already <laughs> over. Uh, it won't mm. be here. In five years' time, it'll be gone. Uh, mm. As to the second question on cost, to be honest, uh, we talked about whether it's 9 million or 10 million net a year. There's a lot of argument. All this is immaterial. The best piece of work on this is give you, although Professor Congdon and I uh, don't agree on almost anything, uh, many a debate we've had over the years. Uh, but one has to respect him completely on one particular issue, uh, his deconstruction of exactly how much the membership of the European Union costs us. He has done the only definitive piece of work that I've seen on exactly how much uh, it costs us. And it's nothing to do with £9 billion uh, a year. That is peanuts in compared with what the membership really costs us in, admin, in, in, in regulation uh, and lost time uh, and uh, the regulating stifling of an entrepreneurial society was also trying to explain to people on the campaign trail a little while ago. A lot of people don't really understand this. Everybody's talking about trade, and that Oxford professor was talking about trade. Oh, serious students of economics, serious students, uh, that's almost anybody who doesn't read economics at a state university, mm. uh, we know, we know the economy in which you live is the butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker, the hairdresser, the cab driver. That is your economy. Yes. The number of people who actually work for a company that physically exports manufactured goods to the continent in this country is minute. Probably two people in 100. Mm. Uh, uh, and so we have this positively extraordinary situation where 100 of us have to comply with the regulations that positively out of Brussels about everything from light bulbs to fire extinguishers we all have to comply which costs a fortune mm -hmm. but only two of us out of have anything whatsoever to do with the European Union save perhaps going on the occasional holiday if they can get via Calais which right. most people can't these days uh, so <laughs> uh, you know I'm better talking about trade agreements and talking talking as though tr international trade uh, was vitally important to the wealth of our nation. Well, of course it isn't, uh, and uh, America is the same. Uh, only 10% of GDP in America has anything to do with international trade. International trade is but a very small part of uh, our economy, uh, and that's something which the average, uh, the average academic economist simply doesn't seem to haul in, and I don't know why, because it's not a particularly difficult concept, is it? Um, mm. <laughs> it isn't mm. difficult. Uh, so, yes, if you want to sell Nissan motor cars in Sunderland to the continent, by all means, you have to meet all the rules and regulations that the continent demands. But nothing to do with me. Nothing to do yes. with me. 
Uh, I, I have no brief for selling Nissan cars to America. I don't want to have to mm. meet all the rules and regulations so some little chap in Northumberland has an easier ride. Uh, no, yes. I'm not interested. Oh, and of course, what is fascinating, and the professor won't have done a homework on this because my experience academic professors only use computer models. They never look out of the window. <laughs> I was in Washington last year. I was in Washington last year, and I thought, I'll just have a nose about. I had a spare hour. And I went into the Mercedes showroom, uh, and there was an S-Class Mercedes, which mm. was very marginally cheaper than an S-Class Mercedes on sale in the Paris showroom. Right. Uh, and <laughs> let's all stop pretending, shall we, that mm. the world is going to end uh, if we leave a customs union a customs union, uh, which is the most anachronistic, probably, uh, economic system that is, uh, is around. In fact, it's the only one left. The EU is the only customs union left on the planet. It's a tariff right. barrier. Correct. Nothing to yes. do with free trade. Yes. Uh, you know, again, your average punch from the street thinks it's a free trade zone. It's nothing of the mm, sort. Mm, right. It's a protectionist group. Your Correct. average American friend, I've got so many friends on Wall Street, they don't get it. They don't get it. And when you actually explain what the European Union is, they stare at you in horror. Yeah. Uh, they wouldn't put up for it for a minute. Right. Uh, but they still write stuff in the, you know, in the New York Times or the Washington Post talking about the concept of economic suicide if we leave the European Union. Mm. I sometimes wonder, I sometimes wonder if some of these scribblers aren't actually retarded in some way. <laughs> One of the problems that the Leave campaign has had, uh, and I'm a little bit cross about this, I have to say, mm. um, they, the, the economic argument for Leave is simply overwhelming. Mm overwhelming. Yes. Uh, you're talking about leaving oh, yes. a customs union where yes. we have a massive trade imbalance, rejoining the rest of the world, retaking our seat at the WTO, uh, yes. getting our seat back with the big boys, with the Americans and the Japanese and the Russians and the Australians. Right. And Vote Leave has failed to make this case, which I regard as being criminal neglect. Criminal neglect. Mm. They didn't field a single first division economist who is televisual, yes, uh, and yeah. they should have done. And there, were, there are choices. If they didn't want to choose me, who's probably, probably one of the best in the field, sorry, I'm too old for false modesty, I'm one of the best <laughs> in the field, uh, they could have put Ruth Lee on the front burner, vote leave. Uh, they, could have put, um, they could have put a number of other people from the Institute of Economic Affairs. The Adam Smith yeah. Institute made yeah, a very good yeah. case first joining the European Free Trade Association, mm -hmm. uh, which, would have won the, which would have won the referendum because on the stump, you could have killed the trade argument. Oh, what are we going to do uh, post-Brexit? We joined the European Free Trade Association. We joined Switzerland, who've just voted 70% in Switzerland to support Brexit. The Swiss are wow. desperate for us to, to Brexit. And we could then form Fantastic. a really serious uh, uh, alliance uh, with the Swiss in the EFTA and still go about our business trading with the rest of the world. But we haven't made the case. The main mm. people who have been on television um, have been people who are simply not competent to make the economic argument. Uh, and I think that's criminally neglectful. And I think it's got more to do with um, people's uh, egos than it has to do with the actual trying to save our country. And I'm, I'm mm. still pretty cross mm. about that. Sure. I mean, everything you've said is, is quite right. We have been for centuries uh, leaders in developing uh, classical liberal principles and applying that at a political level, uh, free markets as well, un undoubtedly, uh, whereas on the continent, the situation is rather different. But we cannot uh, uh, pretend that we do not have those who are heavily in favour of uh, greater centralisation, outright socialism, uh, in our own country. I think the fight lays there as well. Now, I wanted to ask you, do you think I would be right 
Um, and my general feeling is that with the, the Brexit campaigning, it's seen as a bit of a, a crisis slash opportunity. And I think uh, that the leftists have, have really wanted to jump on that in order to really push forward their, their agenda, a more socialistic way of looking at things in, in saying, well, Europe's better because of ABC or you know, greater centralization, greater central control. Well, yes, that's generally good. That's what we should be doing. We should be doing more of that at home. Uh, do you think there's been uh, a lot of that or am I exaggerating maybe? I think I think that's probably true. I think you're quite right. Uh, and I think a great man to listen to on this, uh, as I shared a platform with him a little while ago, and that's Philip Booth of the e, uh, IEA. Mm. Um, and Ruth Lee, of course, who's another one of my mm. heroines, as it were. Um, <laughs> she is quite right on this as well. Make no mistake, Brexit is not the silver bullet. Uh, mm. We have so... It's the one tiny step in the right direction. We mm. have a government in Westminster who genuinely believes that we shouldn't have too much sugar in our fizzy drinks, yes. that we shouldn't have a cigarette in the pub, mm. uh, that we shouldn't do this and shouldn't do that. We have... We have micromanagers in Westminster. And, 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 and what we need to do, I mean, I met lots of farmers on the campaign trail, and they said, used to say to me, look, Godfrey, if we, we would vote out, farmers would vote out tomorrow in spite of the subsidies if we were left alone to mm. farm. Right. I don't want the man from DEFRA walking up to my farmhouse telling me how I can coil up my hose pipes, what size my mm. tractor seats are, yes. uh, whether I have a certificate to reverse my track, which I've been doing for 40 years. I am fed up with all this. But do you think for one minute this will dis disestablish DEFRA if we, if we Brexit? Of course they won't. Of course they won't. So farmers are saying, well, what's in it for me? Uh, there's nothing much in it for me. I'll still have these dreadful little men coming to me from DEFRA. Uh, the only difference is I won't be getting a subsidy to, you know, to put up with it. So these yes, are the, some of yes. the problems that we have. We need massive root and branch reform in our entire political system. And again, with, uh, we've been talking about immigration, uh, of course, as a classical liberal. Uh, I'm not against immigration per se, um, mm -hmm. uh, because I, I, I have libertarian principles. Yes. But we don't have an immigration problem. We have a welfare problem. Correct. Yep. Uh, and yeah. we go back to 1943 and beverage. You only got welfare, you only got support from the state if you bought a stamp, a national insurance stamp, as it was called in those days, uh, it was a subscription basis. And if you hadn't subscribed, you didn't get anything out. Now, that would solve our immigration problem virtually overnight, uh, because not only would people coming into the country not be entitled to welfare, which is very expensive uh, and demoralizing and degrading. Um, yes, yes. Welfare is a disaster, but also mm. it's a disaster. There's no point in bringing in uh, a Polish plumber uh, or somebody from Eastern Europe who's prepared to pick fruit in the freezing cold first thing in the morning, uh, if all that's happening is you're leaving members of the indigenous population watching daytime TV. This is, mm. this is the problem that we have. Mm. And that's the question of um, welfare reform, education and work ethic. Uh, you know, we, we, some of our youngsters have lost the work ethic uh, and of course, welfareism kills the work ethic. Why yes. wouldn't it? Yes. So sure. this is one of the things that we need to address. I haven't heard anybody talk about this. Uh, and of course, on the other hand, people are too frightened to say. Even Nigel Farage hasn't got to say what everybody in the pub is thinking. Most people don't mind the fact that a Czech dentist has come because we've got no dentist in Scarborough. We mm. can now get somebody, we can get a Polish plumber, we couldn't get a plumber before. So most people know that it helps with their lives. What we yes. don't want are people from other parts of the world who are intrinsically hostile to our culture, who don't yes. believe in the treatment of women. Uh, these are people who are, whose whole culture is alien to ours. And I'm a libertarian, so they can do what they damn well like in their own country. But don't come mm. here with your attitude to women like that. Don't come here with your Sharia law. Don't come here with your ghettos. You are not welcome. You are not welcome. Uh, and nobody's mm. had the bottle to stand up and tell it how it is. They're just playing the numbers game. Uh, and I don't think that's particularly fruitful either. I think it, it seems obvious that there will be people who 
um, will have made up their mind already because either, uh, as you pointed out, uh, uh, they, they either don't have the mental faculties to have understood the matter correctly or they simply don't care to, they're just uh, following some party line or, or other. Um, and on the other hand, there are those who already have their mind made up um, because they're, they're fed up with immigration. I think that's a huge um, factor uh, in influencing people. But what I want to ask you, Godfrey, is what would you want to say, quite simply, to those who are thinking people? They either they, they don't have the time or they simply don't have the understanding and they're being honest with themselves and they're saying, I really do want to go along and vote, but I am completely uncertain and I don't want to make a wrong decision here because... I feel it could be disastrous. In, in very simple terms, what would you want to say to them? Uh, well, I would say to them a, a couple of things. First, don't make the mistake that I made in 1975, uh, when all I could sit was blinded by free trade. Uh, you know, I was blinded by the common market. And of course, being a libertarian, classical liberal, I was all in favor in 1975, and I voted in. I didn't look any further. That was clearly a mistake. We were warned by Tony Benn and Enoch Powell and a few others that it wasn't just as simple as signing up for free trade. Mm -hmm. I was a young man of 25. I didn't take any notice. Um, and there are young men now. Don't take notice. Don't be fooled. Don't make the mistake that I made. Uh, because this is not about trade. If you believe in a European super state, and if you believe that a European super state is good for mankind, uh, good for this country and good for Europe, with all its faults, by all means, that is not an ignoble view. In that case, vote remain. But do understand what you're voting for. Do understand what you're voting for, because that's yes. it. Yes. The state isn't available. A lot of people seem to think, uh, I'm doing okay, my family's doing okay, don't rock the boat, mm -hmm. uh, which is a very natural human thing. Right. But the point I would suggest to you is, what we have now is not the deal. Mm -hmm. What we have now remaining, uh, it's going to get ever closer, ever more bureaucratic. They're talking about standardized taxation policy. Uh, they're talking about all the sorts of things which they're keeping very quiet at the moment. The European army, uh, they're keeping quiet about all these sorts of things. As soon as we remain, we, they will take no notice of us. We couldn't get any concessions before we had this referendum. We're certainly not getting any concessions once we stay in. Um, mm -hmm. There is an option. There is an option. And that is what if we vote Brexit, whether I like it or you like it or not, or anybody listening likes it or not, we will have the FTA option anyway, because that is what the government or even if the government's led by Johnson or Gove, uh, the conservative government will simply negotiate membership of the EFTA. Yes. Yeah. That's what we're going to get. Uh, and that's. Uh, there's no reason we couldn't sit doing that for two years. Um, uh, that would be a fruitful uh, exit strategy for a few years while we make our way in the world and regain our seat at the WTO. Uh, but again, mm. we must set to and solve those other problems. Uh, we've got to solve all those other problems uh, of micromanaging the state and, of course, public spending at 50% of GDP. You know, totally unrealistic. For every two pounds... Uh, circulated in our economy, one pound is spent by the government. I mean, dear, oh dear, how did we get this far into the, into the mire? And this is just hopeless. All these mm -hmm. things need a Brexit is just the first step. Because if we don't take the first step, uh, it's cliche time. Uh, you know, the longest journey starts with the first step and the economy is no different. I quite agree. Godfrey, it's been an absolute delight to speak to you. I'm well aware that I've taken up far more of your time than I initially asked you for. Thank you again for your time. I'll let you... A great pleasure there, boy. Great.